original art collection of the University of Virginia. And my co-moderator here is Lisa Javak. She's the assistant to the director and the special projects coordinator at the Freeland Museum of Art. Both of us are museums, art museums at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I'm gonna start by reviewing a few technical things before we get started in earnest. Um, just so you all know, the chat function has been turned off for participants. So you won't be able to use that. Um, as the speakers, as an FYI, we cannot hear or see you. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature to ask your question. Um, if your question is one that one of us moderators can answer, then we will type a response to you. Um, if not, we will hold um, most of the questions until the live Q&A session at the end. And if your question is for a specific speaker, please indicate who your question is for and try to make your question as specific as possible. Um, it's kind of hard for us to clarify your question over the Q&A function. Um, we hope to get to everybody's questions, but depending on how many there are, we may not be able to. So we just, we just ask that you're patient with us on that front as well. Um, we just wanted to let everybody know as well that this webinar will be recorded and it should be posted on the Kluge Roo YouTube channel um, within the next three to four business days of this event. So before we get started, um, I just want to acknowledge that Kluge Roo and the Freeland are located on the land of the Monica Nation and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And since we're all joining from various locations around the world, I just want to acknowledge um, um, I just want to acknowledge all of the indigenous nations where each of us are located. And I encourage you, if you don't know who those indigenous peoples are, that you find out and that you learn about them and their art and culture as well. So welcome to the second webinar in a series where we as university museums are investigating art forms that don't typically show up in the art museum. Um, we felt that there are all kinds of art forms that are culturally dense, really deeply tied to identity, and also formally and technically complex that deserved our attention. Often these are taken for granted because they are uh, a part of our daily lives and aren't set aside or labeled as deserving um, full attention in the actual art museum. So we wanted to give them a, some attention in this way today. Um, and as you all know, I'm sure our theme for today's event is wine labels. Um, to give you a sense of the timeline, each speaker is going to talk just for three to four minutes about their own relationship with the world of wine labels. Um, and then we're going to have um, some moderated questions for discussion. And then we'll open it up for a live Q&A at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Lisa to introduce our first speaker. And we can't, let me see if I can get her video going. Yeah, I was hoping we could see Krista. <laughs> before we yeah, there she is. Okay, great. There she is. Okay. All right. So I am going to share my screen so that the audience can see some images of from our speakers. Okay. All right. Krista Scruggs is a winemaker and founder of Zaffa Wines in Isle de Motte, Vermont, and has become one of the pioneers of the, in the new American wine revival, focusing on hybrid grapes in Vermont. She creates wines, ciders, co-fermentations, and blends of apples and grapes using native fermentation and no fining, filtering, or additives. With a focus on sparkling, Zaffa Wines uses only biodynamic and organic fruit, including hybrid grape varietals and wild apples. Zaffa is 100% woman owned and has intentionally made, maintained a minimum at 85% at all women staff. She is very vocal about Zaffa's intentions to provide opportunities first and foremost to skill qualified marginalized individuals. This includes people of color and women until the industry is reflective of a level playing field of gender and race, 
Safa will forever strive to level up the curve and provide opportunity and equity to those who are not seen or given a chance in a homogenized industry. Welcome, Krista Scruggs. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, and the great, uh, by I mean, the great introduction. Uh, my name is Krista Scruggs. I'm the founder, owner, winemaker, farmer of Zafa Wines. Um, back history of my journey. Um, I'm originally from California. And after working for a larger conglomerate in the wine industry, um, I decided to stage in Washington, Italy, France, Texas, and Vermont. Um, with the intention, um, with a search of a place, a home that I can eventually farm and also make wine. And it was after staging in, in France and uh, returning back to California when I was at Watt, where I was also doing the UC Davis uh, Wine Making Assistant Program, um, I had an opportunity presented itself to me to become um, an assistant winemaker here in Vermont uh, with a producer here, uh, La Garagista. That opportunity then um, led to me um, laying roots here in Vermont, um, and which led to me owning and pounding uh, Zafa Wines. And um, that my, I landed here in Vermont 2016, um, had a five-year plan that quickly turned after my first release in 2017 that uh, opened up the doors uh, with the original intention of me being here, which was owning my own land and winery which uh, along the way, I also started uh, leasing and um, farming and regenerating vineyards that are formerly conventionally farmed here uh, in, in New England. So uh, that, that includes three vineyards and uh, one farm and a vineyard in, in Vermont and then one farm in New, in New Hampshire. And along the way, in a journey that began nine months ago, um, that concluded, inclu concluded about a week ago, uh, Zafa uh, founded its, uh, now has its own land in Isle Lamont, um, where we just actually just round, uh, finished planting 2,000 vines, so, and got first leaf. So this year, actually, 2020 also marks the first year of, of that, of Zafa's first, uh, first year of a vineyard, which will be producing wine from um, four years from now. Um, so the journey started eight years ago and landed me here, and now going into 2020 vintage, I would mark the fourth uh, vintage for Zafa wines. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and talk about the, my, my wines and relationship with uh, how I express myself through wine labels. All right, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. And again, I'm going to share my screen again so you can see her work. Okay, there she is. All right. Jessica Petway is a New York-based photographer that uses humor to create fun and provocative images. She specializes in creating playful compositions and surreal environments in both still life and portraiture. Jessica received a BFA in photography and video from the School of Visual Arts, and her work has been published in the New York Times, Business Week, Vice, The New Yorker, and The Guardian. Additional clients include Apple, Uber, Instagram, Toyota, Publicist Sapient, and Sagmeister and Walsh. Welcome, Jessica Petway. Hey everyone, um, I'm super excited to be here. I'm, like she said, I'm Jessica Petway. I'm based in New York. Um, I love shooting products and portraitures in really fun and unique ways that really allow for brands to stand out in both their campaign and product imagery. 
Um, I'm a photographer, I take photos for a living, but as an artist, I really love when art can really just infiltrate commerce and we can just collaborate with agencies or brands on something really beautiful and um, engaging. Um, also food and beverages happen to be one of my favorite sectors to work in, um, especially because it has been kind of a limited field in both who's working on it behind the scenes and in the imagery. So I think it's really fun to have the opportunity to break the mold of what's traditionally done in that space visually. Oh, thanks so much, Justin. Right, so now we're gonna hear our next speaker. Gumpy, you're Yugerbara was born Stephen Lar Larcombe on Combermurray land in Southport, Queensland, Australia. He is tribally known as Goompy, which means possum. Goompy was introduced to culture at 15 after meeting local Aboriginal dancers from Stradbrook Island who taught him song, dance, and all aspects of the cultural knowledge they had. In 2002, he took notice of Aboriginal art after watching others paint from many different tribes around Australia. He began to experiment with the painting of animalistic styled artworks of his local of, of his local totems and stories until a gallery owner in the community pushed him into creating his own abstract styles. He began using acrylics on canvas to tell the stories he had learned along the way. As a full time artist for over 16 years, he paints every day to keep up with the demands for his unique and eye catching artworks for galleries and clients all over the world partaking in solo and group exhibitions in Australia and overseas. His artwork has attracted the attention of many admirers such, such as Princess Benedicte of Denmark, the Central Intelligence Agency in the US, and many other collectors worldwide who now own his work. Gumpy has always said, and I quote, practicing culture is my passion and I will do this my entire life. Culture is very important. It gives people their true identity, a sense of belonging and empowerment. Welcome, Goopy Yugurbara. Good morning from Australia. Um, my name is Goopy, as I'm referred to today. Um, I'm an Aboriginal artist. I paint with acrylic um, paints on canvas. Um, as you said, I've been doing this for over 16 years and I represent the local people and the stories of where I was born on, on the area on the Gold Coast. So which is just a 45 minute drive south of Brisbane. Uh, when I paint my stories, um, basically most of the stories that I do paint is about not just my history or my ancestors practicing culture, but also um, myself, like what I do with culture. So if I'm painting about something, for example, uh, gathering pippies, I've done this before. So I, I put myself right into the story then when I paint it, so I lose myself. And basically our culture is about passing on the stories to the next generation. So my kids around me are always watching me and I'm also quizzing them on the stories that I paint each and every time. Do you want to talk a little bit about can be your relationship with wine labels and how that, that story came to be? Yeah, so with um, uh, with my Aboriginal dance, I uh, run a dance troupe called Bunjalan Kanjil. Uh, we've travelled overseas to uh, about eight different countries in the last six years. And as we were touring through uh, Europe, uh, we passed uh, through France. We were heading to Italy and we stopped at a winery in Bordeaux. Uh, in a place called Vedele. Uh When we arrived there, uh, we were taken to a cafe to, to eat first before we uh, met um, the winemaker, who was obviously busy working. Um, and as I looked over the valley, I seen all these, uh, all these great vines and red dirt. And basically it, it reminded me of when I was a young kid because 
here in Australia, we have a great country, of course, uh, and a place called Mildura in Victoria. Um, all the Aboriginal families in my area, for some reason, someone started it, but we would all go down every summer and pick uh, grapes down in Victoria. So as far as I remember from a young kid, as I'd say five years old onwards, I've, I've been down there every summer, Nelly picking grapes with my parents and even into uh, a teenager, um, I was doing the cart and putting the grapes on the on the racks and stuff like that. So um, when I uh, met the winemaker, uh, he told me about some art labels that he had already on some on some wine. So me being creative, I wanted to be a part of that. So basically, I told my story on a piece of canvas that I had um, spare before I left to go to Italy the next day, and I popped that underneath his his door and basically two years later he contacted me and said I've found a special wine that is very rare for the area um, but our our meeting was very rare and special as well so I think this is time to put the your artwork on a label so that's how it arose. Cool thanks. Um, Jess you want to Last but not least. Thank you, yes. Thad McQueen and Sean Richards went from longtime employees to co-owners of Market Street Wine in the winter of 2018. Market Street Wine is an independent shop for wine, beer, and gourmet products in Charlottesville, Virginia. Their aim is to serve their customers with personalized attention and tailored recommendations. With their combined 40 years of experience in wine and food, their goal is to satisfy, enhance, inspire, and delight the taste of every customer that walks through the shop door. They sell the best of what is local as well as exceptional products from around the world, drawing heavily from small producers, quality craft breweries, natural and organic vineyards, and wineries of established excellence. Thad and Sean are experienced in tracking down the offbeat and the hard to find, and they particularly love finding products with unique stories. Whether you are looking for a natural wine from a small producer, the perfect beer for a meal with friends, or to add to your private wine library, they have what you need. There has been a wine shop in the cellar of 311 East Market Street since 1979, and Market Street Wine continues the tradition of this location as a cornerstone of the downtown Charlottesville community. Welcome, Thad McQuaid and Sean Richards. Hello. Hi, yeah. Um, so, um, that covers it. Yeah, you've said all the things. So I'm Sean Richards and this is... Fat McQuaid. And we are the co-owners of uh, Market Street Wine, which as um, was said, is a very small independent um, wine and beer retailer located in the cellar of a 100 year old building just off the downtown mall in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and we do focus mostly on smaller producers, family producers, um, organic, natural, and local products. Um, Thad and I are both in our other life, um, actors slash theater makers. Um, so we came to food and wine the way a lot of people in the arts do, which is there was a lot of years of working in restaurants that sort of naturally transitioned into some retail in um, wine because those are the jobs that um, often provide flexibility and allow us to take time to do the other work that we want to do. Uh, the previous owner of this store, who was the owner for the longest period of time, as was mentioned, the shop's been here since 1979, um, founded by a gentleman who founded another institutional uh, business downtown, a restaurant called the CNO. Um, but the man, Robert Harley, who we worked for and who was the longest running owner of the shop was retiring a couple of years ago. And so that provided an opportunity for us to own a, a business, but also to keep this business going, which um, not for everybody in Charlottesville, but for a lot of people in Charlottesville was a really, um, a really important part of their lives growing up here. So there's multiple people, a couple of generations now as we get older that may have come as children with their parents for bread or for sweets or a treat and then they grow up and it becomes a place that they're introduced to 
um, good wine and good beer and they bring their friends and um, that's probably happened a few times that rotation so it was also a chance to kind of um, keep that going for Charlottesville and dust it off a bit and give it a bit of a polish and uh, a little bit of new life and hopefully it'll keep, it'll keep running. Yeah, I think the only thing to add is that the uh, our other lives, as Sean said, are uh, relevant to our work here. Uh, what we tend to focus on in making theater is creating experiences for people and creating environments uh, uh, for people, and um, we're still we're still doing that. It's not really a different work uh, uh, to to try and create an experience. Of course. Now, uh, nobody's walked into our store for five months. So, yeah, but, but we still try and, and how we interact with people, try to, I, mean, I find we're using a lot of our, our skills as artists to continue to try to tell stories about the wines, to create a relationship with the wines, and to create a possibility for using wine or beer or, or non-alcoholic something to create a moment of communion, which is, I think, what our largest goal with all of this. It's just an excuse to meet for people to meet together. And we're really excited to be here with all these amazing, yeah. beautiful, talented people. Cool. Well, thanks so much, everyone, and thanks, Lisa, for those introductions. Um, I love all, all of you have already touched on the power of a wine label to tell stories, which I think is what art does often, too, which is really cool. So hopefully we'll come back to that theme um, as uh, we uh, lead into the discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask Krista and Jessica to talk a little bit about their working relationship. And I want to start with you, Krista, because you all, you know, you clearly had a vision for what you wanted your labels to look like. So can you talk a little bit about um, why you wanted to commission an artist to, um, to design a wine label and how you met Jessica and what that partnership was like? So three questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, I, I'll start with um, you know, I'd been a fan of afar of Jessica's work, um, particularly I discovered her on Instagram. Um, we have some um, mutual friends throughout the, 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 I think the food and beverage industry. Um, and also us both being, um, you know, black women and in, 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 in the industry. And then when we, we recognize, when we, if we have access to each other, I think that we, especially, especially in our industry, we make sure to collaborate so but I was just a fan and I and after harvesting you know the 2019 vintage and then it's after harvesting and after fermentation I start tasting through then I start the whole process more or less of what the uh, how I'm going to express uh, that vintage through the wine names and, and this particular vintage 2019 when you know, Zafa grew exponentially and there are things in place, for example, you know, starting the, the, the journey to when it seemed actually within reach to have my own land, which a journey, you know, the, the, the business side of it started last year and going through that while also going through harvest, you know, I became very clear that, um, you know, as opposed to each vintage up to this point, I, you know, I, I don't name my wines the same. I don't make the same wine every year, but 2019 was symbolic um, in a lot of ways in my growth um, and, you know, mistakes, mistakes made and also um, things that I accomplished that I felt that needed to be defined within what is now called the Visions of Gideon Collection. And, you know, I'll add through all my, you know, fillers and, you know, I think mostly highlighted my successes um it's still you know the success of this brand is still something that's very surreal for me that i that i i have to compartmentalize because i'm still on the grind and still you know i'm starting harvest in a couple of weeks and uh, you know i could be on television one day and i still on a small business that's growing and i'm still a human being that's navigating a lot of things at the same time um so it was through the her work and also the way that i wanted to communicate how I wanted to express uh, what 2019 for me, because my what I try to do is the wine is going to tell a story of what was happening in the vineyards. And for me as a producer and a winemaker, I take the label as opportunity to, 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 to communicate what was going through with me personally through that year. And um, I, you know, I reached out to her and I, you know, I was like, hey, 
you know, I more or less said what I said, like, you know, I, it, how much I might have worked and it'd be a dream to, um, you know, collaborate with her. And, you know, I made it very clear, like I, you know, as opposed to the last vintage when I worked with, I think four different artists, like, because this was a collection, it was important to me to work with one person to tell the story as it being a collection and for continuity. And we started there and then, you know, I sent her a detailed email of, you know, the first, you know, she's, she's done the first five now. Um, there's still going to be eight more wines are going to come out. And the first five, I, you know, I provided the title of the wine, why I named it that wine. Um, and also why this was a collection. And, and I felt that her, through her medium, she could also, she could capture that, but also capture the surrealism that I'm navigating emotionally, but express that uh through her art and you know when people see the labels they don't realize that that's photography and a lot of people think that that the labels are something that is digitally created and she did that through photography and, and that even added an extra layer and then when i sent her the description when i sent her the the description and everything and she sent me the mood board and she was able to and, and then the mood board and 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 her vision of my vision but Simpatico, it, it you know gave me chills, and it, it also reaffirmed like why she was the right person for this. Uh, what my instincts thought that she could truly capture what I was trying to express, and she did it successfully. Um, that was my experience. That experience that we're still navigating because um, we still have eight more labels to do. We just wrapped up the last five, but um, I don't think there is anyone who could have actually now in hindsight could have could have captured exactly a high one to capture it through her their their art and hear my voice and that my voice will be heard at the same time so beautiful um lisa we've had a couple questions of people just wanting to see the labels so um maybe we can go back to that powerpoint um just to show at least a few of the works and i know our pre-show slides show also had one of the bottles at least showing on the side there um yeah so we'll try to get that up for you people who asked that question um, but I love what you said, Krista, about how like you had a, like that the wine label was, is meant to sort of tell your own personal story of the year and, um, really fascinating just that, that relationship and, and how you were able to navigate that. Um, so Jessica, can you talk a little bit about what, the, what thing, what, what that collaboration was like on your side? Um, and you talked in your introduction about how passionate you are about, um, bringing sort of your work um, into, um, into a relationship with commerce. Um, so I would love, it would be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, well, working with Krista was such a dream. It really was such a perfect match. Um, everything that they were inspired by for this vintage really resonated with me. Um, and it was, there are a lot of things that I could relate to as far as, um, just growth and um, even just our experience as black women in this field. So it really was such a great um, match to then make images to. Um, and then what was your other part of it? Like shooting food and things. Sorry, what was that? And then you wanted to know about like shooting food and stuff. Oh, well, just like that kind of relationship between like when you're making work for a client that you know is going to be basically product design, how does that change your practice versus um, how you might approach, you know, doing work for yourself or for a gallery? Yeah, um, well, this was really different for me. I've never um, shot the product images, like the labels before. Typically, I'm shooting... The finished product so it was really cool to kind of come in at the beginning and really help develop how the product looked that was just an amazing privilege um and it was really awesome working with krista too because i just felt like we were so aligned and krista really just gave me free reign to explore those themes um and that was really fun and it's a lot like how i work for my personal work just giving myself kind of loose boundaries and um, going from there. Was there much back and forth between you or 
like how and to what extent was that process collaborative? Um, it was pretty brief. Um, Krista sent over the concepts and a bit of a mood board for look and feel and then I sent one back and we were just super aligned and then from there I just started shooting and throughout the day would send Krista and the team um, previews and it was super seamless. I think just we just had the same experiences and could really just think of bringing it to life in the same way. So that was super fun. Cool. Hey, Gumpi, can you speak to that a little bit too, just um, about sort of what that collaboration was like with the French winery owner? And um, I know it, it sounded like, just based on uh, what I've heard you talk about, that he sort of was just like, you know, you gave me this artwork and I want to use it. Was, was there more back and forth between the two of you? Or how, how, did, that, um, how did that collaboration develop? Uh, when, when I left, uh, this, uh, so basically, uh, in the, in the slides, you'll see the, the sort of ochre, red ochre colored artwork. So it was basically a, a 10 centimeter squared, um, canvas board. So that one there, and, uh, just, it was really simple. I only had a small amount of paint as I was traveling. Um, so I, I painted this, um, very simply to represent the red dirt of Mildura. Um, also the grapes uh, in, along in the grapevines. Um, so when I left it there, I didn't really hear back from him for, like, I left a little note to say, if you ever need this for a wine label, uh, let me know and we can have a chat. Uh, I didn't hear from him for probably a month, Nelly. So, he, and I noticed over the years now, he, he doesn't go on the internet very much. So that's why, um, but basically, uh, when he did contact me a few years after this, um, it, there was a little back and forth with, um, in regards to this uh, artwork now with the, the colour form, because in Australia here, uh, for tribal people, um, sometimes the colours of the ochres represent an area, and because my area is on, on a coastline on the east coast, uh, we have white and greys and even some black coloured ochres in, in the sides of our rivers and, and with the clays. But out in the desert, out, out further, you have red and yellow ochres. So basically, I had to try to convince him for me to paint another artwork with my colour form. Um, so we, with the black, white and greys. So that went back and forth a little bit because he fell in love with the original. Um, so we come to an agreement where every six that comes in a carton, one of them will have uh, the red label and one will have the other one. Um, oh, sorry, the five five other ones will have the black and white on it. So the red label is actually rare. So there's only 1,400 uh, created all up. He, he got 1,400 bottles out of the, out of the wine, out of the grape. Um, so basically the black and white one is, is more of the elaborate story of myself uh, traveling to France, but also traveling to Victoria from the Gold Coast um, and how that connection come together and the connection is the grapes and, and my travels basically. But yeah, the guy, um, uh, Thomas, his name is, uh, very kind. Um, we didn't need to sort of discuss too much further. It was basically already done and I actually traveled over there to do the launch um, with him and his family and all, all the people in the in the area of Bordeaux. So we had a lot of people come to the launch. And a good interesting story is that when I arrived, he already had the wine for probably three months already made. And when I arrived for dinner that night, uh, my translator told me basically that he waited for those three months as he was the only one who tasted the wine. And I was the second person to taste it. No one else was allowed to until I tasted it. So that was really a privilege and, 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 and something that I was really chuffed about. So That's so interesting. And I, I want to come back to this idea of like, how can you embody the taste of something visually? Um, and, you know, how like the varying degrees of su success um, of, of that, um, of that challenge. Um, but yeah, so it sounds like he really respected 
your connections that you were drawing between your experience in France and Australia and wanted to like use the wine as a way of demonstrating that and expressing that, which is really interesting. Um, Definitely. I, I, um, we've had a couple questions about Krista and um, Krista, where, where to find your wine um, already. People have been looking for it and want to know where to find it. So I'll let you answer that question. But then um, there's also um, for Jessica, there's been a question about just wanting you to talk specifically about one of the images that we have and what your inspiration was and what and what the sort of um, uh, what the sort of notes were from Krista about what she was trying to express. So I think people wanted a little bit more detail on that. And Lauren, I was going to go back, and Krista, I'm going to go back to the slide that is actually um, in Krista's segment because it shows, yeah, this one, I think, since then we can see an actual bottle. If, if you want to talk about this, Jessica. Um, that one, I forget what that concept was. Um, it's, it's less for life. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> that one was um lust for life so um i kind of just incorporated plants that's just what i personally love shooting with and also that doesn't symbolize life and then um i attached gems to it um i think that kind of gave a bit of a note of just the lust for life and um just raciness and just chasing material things and um the eyes i kind of added in throughout our labels i think that was also a note from krista but just in general we just wanted everything to feel surreal and it was kind of a nod to surrealists that i learned about prior um and i just love the way they look kind of place here and there um Lisa, can you just highlight where the eye is? Because I think it might be hard for people to see. Yeah, it's right there in the middle. So, Krista, can you speak a little bit to, to this if you want to? Yeah, uh, Lost for Life. Yeah, Lost for Life. Uh, a spark barrel aged sparkling um, rose wine. Um, and this is actually the first time I worked predominantly with glass. And this is actually the first wine that I released that was barrel aged. It did have part of its life been. Part of his life in glass and the uh, second part of his life uh, in barrel. And um, the it, Lust for Life is, a, is the name of a song um, performed by Lana Del Rey featuring The Weeknd. Um, I was, there's an album that they released last summer that I apparently was listening to a lot. And um, the particular lyric that I quote on the back of the bottle. Um, so I usually do give a, a, like a, a quote that is related to every, the name of it and why, and to give some kind of insight of why I named that wine what it is. Um, and it is, the quote in the back of the label is, uh, and which I gave to Jessica too, uh, before she just designed this, was the, um, I'm the master of my own fate and captain of my own soul. Um, and why I named that one, particularly wine, this wine that, is that this wine, you know, my first time, working with barrel in that way. And this wine, you know, basically directed itself. I had my own intentions with it. And this wine, as all fermentations do, they do their own thing and it's me accepting it. And the wine within, uh, the wine itself became the master of its own fate and it captures it its own soul. And it's something that, in that particular lyric, something that resonated with me in regards to just navigating, you know, standing by my vision and, and you know, while navigating doubt of other people and, or my own um, imposter syndrome, and that, and then we're remembering that I have, I have some control in all of this, and and then and, and why I named this particular wine that because that in that vintage that wine took its own control outside of my intentions of what uh, my vision for that wine. It 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 it, 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 it didn't give a, it didn't care what my vision was. It did its own thing, and that's kind of more or less how I navigate my own life and have um, um, taken what I deserve. I guess. Um, so yeah. Um, and in regards to where my wines are available, they're about, like, we just, uh, as of now, I think the only thing that's not sold out is I think there's a couple bottles of Carver left. Um, Lust for Life is unfortunately sold out. Um, it was only first available in our wine club. And then we released 
a few cases, the last of it yesterday, and it got eaten up. Um, and um, so the best way to get my, like, what best way to get access to my wine is joining a newsletter, go to the website, zoffawines.com, and join a newsletter. You actually, outside of the wine club, you get first dibs on new releases, because it's showing commitment to, you know, to you know people what's up to date. Um, I'm distributing California, New York, Florida, um, Texas, and Massachusetts, and Vermont. And I believe all the wines that were released earlier this year are unfortunately sold out, but we are releasing, um, all those states will be receiving Carver and um, Jungle Fever, uh, which are the two of the labels that are presented here. Those will be hitting all those states uh, in the next few weeks. But the best way to get, to keep, uh, either join, for the, join the wait list for the wine club or just sign up for a newsletter and we do um, honor those people first and getting access to the wines. Um, I, I, as a farmer, I, I want to say I can only produce of what I farm. And so we're, you know, we're not, we, we only make, you know, 1500 cases, which in the big picture is not a lot. Um, and a lot of it is available directly from us. Um, and um, our, our new, and we have a tasting room here in Burlington too, that you could have access to our wines, but I'll, uh, just join the newsletter and you, that'll be the best way to stay up to date, I would say. Yeah, and well, um, some people have also asked how to um, access the wine that Gumby's uh, artwork is on the label of as well. So we'll we'll send an email afterward to everybody who uh, who um, has registered for this event with some details on um, how to learn more and how to get access. <laughs> so no worries about that. Um, I want to refocus to sort of the consumer side of things and the reception of wine labels and how it influences buying behavior. Um, that and Sean, do you want to? start by just sort of talking generally about how you, how you, what your experience has been with uh, the reception of wine labels and how wine labels either turn people off or turn people on and yeah, they do or don't reflect the wine. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think how to, how to like sort of cover the whole big picture. Uh, they have a huge effect. I would be the shortest possible answer to that, that they have a huge effect on how people receive wine. Um, maybe especially in, I don't know, part of the thing is we run this little store and more and more as people start to buy all kinds of things they want and need in their life uh, from not small stores, from online people that recommend things based on algorithms or from people that just ship it to you or um, big box stores. Obviously a lot of the pleasure people get out of coming into a shop like this mm -hmm. when they can come into a shop like this, hopefully that will be how we live our lives again sometime. Um, was getting to look at every individual bottle. A huge part of that is the label. Some of it is obviously make, people will make some different choices about bottle shapes and, and things that make their wine stand out. But it's like visiting a little apothecary. You're sort of digging through all of the different stuff. Um, I think there's been a transition in that um, more and more people are really paying a lot of very conscious attention to labels in terms of winemakers or producers who are putting that kind of thought and effort bringing on people who have real talent and skill to, to craft something special uh, that has increased over the years um, a lot of it has to do with who the people are like what their associations are what the context is for them whether they're completely alone in that decision or if someone is helping to guide them and things are shifting a lot um, for younger consumers and for younger uh, winemakers and producers as well, in terms of stuff that looks more like the labels that you've seen tonight, even um, maybe slightly less the real Gumpy's artwork um, in different ways. These are labels that would have been really, really, really unusual just a little while ago, like Bordeaux to have something that isn't just, yeah kind of a white label with some classic um, lettering and certainly these super surreal, amazing images on um, Jessica and um, Krista's bottles as well. Did I say anything just now? You did. Okay. <laughs> it's shifted, it shifted enormously. I mean, I, uh, I started working in this store in 1989 and was, this was for retail, at least in Virginia, right when things were starting to crack open as far as wine labels and people like Randall Graham of Bonnie Dune uh, Vineyards were starting to play and starting, but starting to play with serious wines. This was something that, that hadn't been part of my experience or of any of the people around me beforehand. If you were making a serious wine, 
your label had to authorize that and it had to refer to history and it had to it had to really make convince you particularly i think for american wines or sort of generally new world wines sort of living in the shadow of europe and and we really were kind of went overboard in trying to authorize ourselves and then you had somebody like Randall Graham and a lot of other people in California, sort of ex-hippies who were like, yeah, I don't know, put a fish on it. Uh, but we're still going to charge, you know, it's, we still put a lot of work into this wine, so we're going to charge you some money for it. And there was, I know, a lot of resistance for those people that they had to fight to really get their wines taken seriously. But fortunately, they, they kind of persevered with their playfulness. And, and so now, 30 years later, there is a tremendous range of things. We have very serious wines, wines that, are, that carry a big price tag in the store that have super fun labels. Um, but also, there doesn't seem to be as narrow a box uh, for what a wine needs to look like anymore. So we have wines that have fun labels that are, that are pricier, nicer wines, but also you don't there's just there's just more options, which I think is is really really good. I think it's very healthy to have to have more options. The way things are being authorized, because of course people are still still trying to sell things, but there are rather than appealing exclusively to history or to uh, some authority having blessed that particular wine, things are now being authorized in, in using visual references. Um, particularly with social media, with the Instagram. It's a huge thing for us. I don't think we saw this coming a couple of years ago. How massively important. I mean, we know a lot of the way that we have uh, interacted with Krista's wines has been visually and through sort of social media and through reputation. You know, we can't actually get those wines here and we've been lucky enough to have some people share those wines with us. Um, a, Reggie, couple, a couple times, watching. Reggie, who's watching tonight, Thank you, Reggie. put in some smart questions, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, so, but we're very, very conscious of the work that you're doing, and we're trying to follow your story and trying to make sure that we're we're uh, uh, amplifying your story, even though physically the wine's not in the store, but the imagery from the wine is, and the imagery of your of your vineyards, and the imagery of you, which I'm sure is is complicated <laughs> when, you're, when your image is blasted all over the world. But that's something that was, you know, again, 30, 20, 30 years ago, you, I might see a label that we couldn't get in an issue of Wine Spectator or something like that. But that was kind of it. And then you started getting some wine blogs, some super nerdy wine blogs. And now we're just inundated with, you know, all the time we get somebody sends us a link uh, on Instagram and says, hey, this looks cool, can you get this? And it, they're not saying it because it comes from a famous vineyard. They're not saying it because it got some high linear point score. They're saying it because something about the whole package, the vineyard, the label and everything appeals to them on some, on some uh, aesthetic way. Did yeah. I say anything? Yeah, I think we both said the things. Do with that with yeah. what you will. Did you, um, before we started, Sean, you had a couple of labels that you were like, can we hold things up? And I was like, oh. yeah, do you want to you share a few of the ones that, you, that you've had really strong reactions to, positively or negatively? Or uh, Well, there's some extreme stuff. There's a couple that we, we had a couple here just like kind of as a juxtaposition. Um, so like a white, a sort of nice, high-end um, white burgundy, which is what you would expect, like the kind of the label, you mostly see this. You almost, I think Burgundy and Bordeaux are two regions where we still feel like you do not get as much um, play as other places, which is why Goopy's label is so cool. Yeah, really but cool. then there's also this guy, who has just kind of gotten rid of all of that. It looks like it's just been scribbled on there with like a chalk pen, but you know, it's a hundred dollar bottle of Merceau. So there's definitely like some contrasts there. And then there's like the extreme, I think I can put that cause it's, um, uh, I don't know if you guys can read that. That's a Fabian Juve wine that says you bleep my wine. Uh, and the label, late, the, well, there's some things happening with the bottles. <laughs> bottles as bodies. So, bottles yeah. as bodies. But that's, so, a, that's a label that wouldn't exist 
in our, we wouldn't have gotten that label. I mean, it, I'm sure it wouldn't have gotten label approval in Virginia or five years ago. Charles Defour, so a really fine, delicious bottle of champagne. Again, another place where you just don't see as much, we don't at least, as much people doing stuff like this with their label. It's still usually pretty classic. Um, yeah, or then there's like, that has this um, really expensive bottle. Yeah, uh, one of Helen Turley's project, the Marcus project. So that's actually a label that she's had for quite some time. And it looks, it's one of those labels that at a distance looks like sort of a classical engraving, uh, but it seems to be a boar being disciplined by a naughty school marm or something. We don't know what's happening. Yeah, we don't quite know what the story is, but it's obviously evocative. So this is, these are things that wouldn't have existed uh, before. And I think it's, I think it's, I think it's good. And they're still authorizing themselves, but they're authorizing themselves with a very different audience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very much depends who walks in the door. I mean, I hear Lust for Life and I think Iggy Pop because I'm super old. Uh, <laughs> but a younger, cooler person is going to think of Lana Del Rey uh, and, and is going to have a different kind of response to it. Both cool, but, but <laughs> different. So we certainly have customers who would not buy or who would be surprised by, or shocked yeah. by, or turned off by yeah. a wine, you know, a label with bottles of doing sort of Kama Sutra things. Uh, but we have other people who might, we're gonna seek that out because that to them says, this is a person who's playing, he's playful, he's not too reverent. Fortunately, the wine is also awesome. So when those two things align, then it's, then it's really, it's a, it's a positive growth mm -hmm. from my perspective. I wish it rep Virginia very quickly. Oh yeah. Because as, 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 as Virginia wine. Virginia was definitely like leaning super hard into the like, nothing surprising mm -hmm. happening here, just a very classic, respectable bottle of wine for many years. And then we have uh, Lightwell Survey, winemaker Ben Jordan, who makes wines for a couple other places as well. And this wine is called The Weird Ones Are Wolves, which is like totally something you never would have seen. I mean, even like five, seven years ago, let's say. Yeah, John, I should say the artist on that, we should probably be crediting oh, yes, people. We should. Uh, John DiNapoli is the artist, uh, and I think that uh, he's worked with them for a while. Um, the other thing that's cool is, is like, as with Krista, this is now a way to, for people to, to collaborate with artists uh, and also, you know, support some, support some artwork and have that artwork support them, which is a very healthy, I think it's always very good when people can collaborate across disciplines. Um, and I think people want that. So the more, especially, like I said, in a store like this, where we cannot be that other thing, the like mass quantity arriving at your doorstep tomorrow thing, we very much have to go, we are going in the other direction from that thing. So people love the stories because why else would you come into a little store and talk to some people? You want to hear all of the things about it. And if that includes um, information about the artist who made it or the inspiration that is behind it or why it's this image as opposed to something else, that just adds multiple layers to the uh, experience of in enjoying the wine. And I think we were talking about this earlier Another thing that has changed is that labels obviously have always sold wine. People, whether they admit it or not, are, are factoring that into the choices that they make. But I think um, outside of maybe that moment where there were the, the sort of commodity wines with cute animals on them that had the moment, and then everyone was like, that's why we should not be buying those cute animal commodity wines. Um, People have been very self-conscious about the idea that they might factor that into the choices they make. But I think that's another thing that's shifting, especially in a lot of our younger and or um, kind of people who lean towards a smaller producer or a natural producer or something like that. They're factoring that in really um, without, without being self-conscious about it at all or feeling like, it's a, like it, there's anything wrong with including that in the choices that they're making. Like they're really, um, embracing the idea that the imagery that they see is a big part of what they're pulling off the shelf. So I love that you came back to stories there at the end. Um, I would love to hear from each of you about sort of the power of a label to tell a story, um, even in that split second decision making for the consumer. I think that's really 
like in the art museum, right, the you visitors walk through and they expect to read a story about an artwork and they leave time for that, maybe. I mean, I don't know, there's a lot of studies that show that museum visitors spend like three seconds on each label. Um, but still, that might be that might be actually more than what they spend on like sort of interpreting um, a wine label. So I would love to hear from each of you about sort of how you feel like your label or the labels that you work with um, effectively tell the story of, of the wine itself. We've all kind of touched on that, but I would love like a little kind of like condensed, succinct, like this is what it does, if you can manage that. Goopy, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so as I, as I, I, I touched on earlier, uh, when I left that artwork, um, I already heard Thomas say that he knows artists in the local community. And so when he starts, has a wine and he starts to taste it, that it, it, it has a character, so it speaks to him. So he, he tastes it, he smells it, and it has a character. So if ever that character relates to an artwork that he's seen in the local community, then he will attach that obviously given the artist will give permission um, to, to the wine label to, to tell that story that he's thinking uh, from his point of view and and he's had the the wine um, like in, in generations for three or four generations so he, he's growing up with his father grandfather and great-grandfather making wine so this was the way they all did it so um, with mine because I've already given him the artwork he he did say when it does match then i will i will actually put that onto a wine if it ever does so the reason why he put my artwork on that label on that wine two years later is because it was such a special meeting uh meeting us for us to perform our culture in france uh, for his local community um so when he tasted the wine he said oh, i tasted it and it, it, it was a special grape because in Bordeaux, usually is I'm not quite sure because I'm I'm not right into the wines in descriptive um, sort of terms, but they're more punchy uh, wines. But with this, it was a very soft grape, which was only grown in his area. So because it was such a special meeting, he, that's why he wanted to put my artwork on there because we had that special meeting and this was a special grape. So. Um, with um, the original, I think I touched on that, but with the, the, the elaborate one that I did with the black, white and grey, basically um, that, that told the story of how I grew up in grape area and also travelling to his area, how it connected. And what was quite interesting is when I arrived, if you, when you feel the label, he got it printed where there's like, it feels like dots. So there's actual texture to the label, which was really awesome. So basically it, it told that story of our, our, our meeting, our connection and meeting of two cultures basically, which was, which was really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Um, Jessica and Krista, you wanna talk a little bit about? This yeah. Story? Yeah, I could, I mean, I could, I could elaborate and then Jessica could tend them off of me but for me uh similar to similar to, similar to the the producer that we works with is that i don't uh, i even have a name it says i'm navigating like right now we're going into the 2020 vintage and there's wine names that i already have written down um just that relate to what i'm navigating right now in 2020 um but that name will not be attached to a wine until I taste that wine and that. And then there's names that I've have, have had for four years that a wine hasn't, I haven't made a wine that that name uh, attaches to. Uh, and I maybe never will because, you know, how it well is going through 2016 is in the past and I'm now here in 2020. Um, and, you know, it, it, particularly the process I went through with Jessica's, what I've gone through with every artist, I just state, this is the why I named this one. This is, what I went through this is like an awful little like this is what I went through this last year this is why I'm naming this wine this is why this this is um the quote that I plan on using attached to that name of the wine and this is why 
but then I give creative autonomy. After that, um, I have, I've been selecting an artist to work with them, selecting to work with them for a reason, for their expression. And, 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 and then I give them autonomy to then take, you know, this is why, this is the story, the journey that I went on this last year. And then now you, you, if you can connect with this, usually what happens is they set the project, connect with this and you interpret it through the way, through your art. And I'm trusting that you're going to express it, you know, through, like, express it in a way that I feel heard, but it's, but it's through you because it's very clear that I chose you to tell this story for me. And when in the final label, the layout, the Zafa is minimum there. I purposely, it's very intentional that the artwork takes over the label and then Zafa is a little square on the back of the label. Um, it's, you know, I have a dedication, um, this particular, the name of the, the name of the vintage, uh, name of the wine, the, you know, quote that follows that wine, whether it be from Jersey Washington Carver or Lana Del Rey. And then, you know, uh, attribute to the artist, and then that's it. And I purposely don't, and I really fill the space of the art, then, you know, even fill in space with naming the varieties because um, I'm leading with someone experiencing the, experiencing the wine. You're having, well, you're able to hopefully take vulnerability from me from the artwork and what the dedication in the back of the label. And then, and that's my story. And then the wine will tell its own story. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't, but either way, both parts of it, me as a human being, and then the wine itself is being vulnerable. And then the artist is just expressing that. And so I lead, I purposely intentionally lead with the artwork. Not, not to be sold, but to actually objectively tell my story. And then, and then if that resonates, you know, and if the images resonates and then, and then at least we're connecting that way from a from producer consumer level. No, that's fa it's fascinating because both of you already, both you, Krista and Goofy, you both have talked about how the label actually has to tell two or three stories, right? It has to tell, like, I mean, in your case, Goofy, it's your own story, the story of the winemaker, and also the story of the wine itself, right? And yes. and and for you, Krista, it's your own story, the story of the wine, and also almost like the artist's interpretation of of of, exactly. of your experience. So it's 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 such like a multi layered story but Jessica do you want to speak to that yeah um like Krista said um I got the story behind each wine and it really did resonate with me um and I really appreciated the opportunity to create five different labels or different environments that at the end of the day are unified and to me that is really just like the expression of a person like you can be inspired by Carver and then also be inspired by Lana Del Rey like no one is a monolith so I really appreciated getting five different concepts to unify under visions of Gideon. Um, I, the other and final question I have for you all before we open up to some of the audience questions is um, it seems like innovation has been a, a theme that I'm kind of hearing throughout all of what you all have been saying. So how can the artwork, how can the wine be innovative, but then also how can the label or the artwork respond to that in an innovative way? Um, and Thad and Sean, you two were sort of talking about how people have gotten bolder um, and more and, and, and a bit more innovative with their labels, but I would love to hear just m more on each of, each of those fronts, because one of the things about contemporary art in general is that um, innovation is valued, right? Within uh, within within the actual um, within the actual contemporary art world. So it would be interesting to sort of think about how the labels function as art in that in the sense that they're innovative. Does that make sense? And my that question resonate. Cool, cool. Uh, and Sean, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. I think the perfect example is what you, is what uh, uh, Chris and Jessica were just talking about. I feel like it would have been harder for them to do that uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. that there would have been more pressure uh, to, to make a label look like a particular thing rather than be able to tell, to tell a particular story, whatever that looked like. Uh, um, you know, that it would have to, you'd be like, well, you have to, Safa has to be big on the label. 
you can have your artwork, but Zafa has, I mean, I, I, I think that you're in a position where nobody's actually in a position to say any of that to you, which is, is also awesome. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but that you might hear from distributors who would say, hey, we can't sell this, nobody knows what it is, or from retailers who say, uh, people don't know what, they look on the shelf and they can't tell what kind of wine this is. And that for sure was a thing until very recently for us. Uh, and now, again, especially with younger people, I don't wanna, you know, put everybody in one box. There's some old people too. There's some there's cool, some old, cool people. old people. <laughs> but, uh, but with a lot of our younger customers, they're less concerned. They're like, oh, oh that's cool. There's, not, there's no words on this label. And that's an intriguing thing rather than a repelling thing. Yeah, it's an actual part of the experience too, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's it's more than that it's not, it doesn't, oh great, it didn't fail to sell your wine. It is actually like adding layers of experience to having that wine go home with you, right? That people are interested in the idea that there's, um, that the creation doesn't end with the wine that was made, which is enough, it's plenty, but that, that it keeps going to um, the images on the labels and what is communicated by that. Awesome. Jessica, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, um, well, I think that people that don't really know a lot about wine can really connect with something that's visual, something like a look and a feel of something. And I think that's super, important with labels now or maybe with the younger generation where I don't know too much about wine but if I am intrigued by a label I'll learn more I'll ask more about it um, versus maybe seeing a lot of information and um, I think that's happening a lot in food in general I've worked with some other brands where like something that's say like organic or only has a couple ingredients or like a power bar doesn't have to just have imagery of like someone at a gym or like it doesn't have to have that like typical imagery it can be fun it can be playful the packaging could be pink the packaging could have like foil um i think a lot of people are wanting to connect more with a feeling like i think they get the idea of the product and just want to feel a part of a community or a part of the process with the maker or just really relate to that. I think what you say about how inaccessible almost a lot of wine labels can be is so true, right? Like, do you all experience that, that in Sean as well, where people walk in and they're like, tell me how to interpret all this French language. <laughs> like, I don't know what this wine means. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, those things, if, if and when you um, go on to learn those things, which some people don't have any interest in, and that is actually fine, but, um, they tell you a lot and they're useful. And I would say some of the people that are probably resistant to labels being different are the ones that have, have spent maybe the time to learn all of that information. So it actually tells them a lot about what they're getting. But otherwise, it doesn't convey, um, it doesn't convey a lot of like feeling or um, sense or, does that make sense when I say that? So, so labels do speak do back that, almost under something a lot more quickly to people. Yeah, it's almost like a label with just text doesn't speak back to the consumer in the same way that a, a visual work would. Um, somebody asked uh, in the Q and A, Thad and Sean, um, if people ask about the stories behind labels, some of the ones that you you've shown, and how frequently do you know those stories? And are is is that a common question or no? Um, I don't know if it's super common for people to really say, can you tell me why this label looks this way? Um, we don't get that information as much as it would be really cool to get it actually. So this has been a, an awesome experience. Unfortunately, we don't get this backstory very often. We would love to have it and the people buying wine here would love to hear it. Um, but they do want a story generally. Yep. That's also what we're selling. I mean, that's the whole reason for this for this whole uh, business is to is to different ways of telling stories, and the labels have become more a part of telling that story. 
used to be the wine told the story and we would always try to learn about who made this wine, where they came from, was it a family, was it, are they doing something radically different from their neighbor, you know, whatever the backstory was. And now more and more the labels have become part of that and when possible, you know, if we, if we had one of Chris's wines in here, that this would now become part of the story that we're telling and Jessica's story would be part of very much. And we could say, you gotta go check out her site. This stuff is amazing. You can't be sad when you look at her, at her artwork. Uh, you know, that will be part of what our pitch is. And for a lot of our customers, that is part of what they are looking for. And we don't mean that, like when we say sell a story, we don't mean that cynically. We mean like, yeah. what's the point, right? We're all existing here. The yeah. point is to connect and for all of these things we're doing in our lives to have some meaning and some layers and some levels and to bring us joy. So that's what we mean. You can, um, you can pick up a case of wine anywhere, but hopefully, hopefully you're taking some value home that goes beyond the thing in the bottle when you come into a small store and get to learn a little bit about the backstory. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just a larger conversation also about branding. Um, I guess there's like a billion ways to make wine, but it has been around. So I guess it's more of what, how is your wine different and how is it initially different through the label when someone sees it? If they've never heard about it, if they don't know about wine, it's the branding and the story that's gonna grab their attention first. Yeah, absolutely. Because it makes it clear that it has come from a particular person, right? That it has come from a specific human or specific humans, and it has come to us, our specific people. That's like a coming together. That's what the. That's why it brings pleasure. Awesome. Well, I know that there are some great questions that we've gotten. Lisa, do you have one already kind of queued up that you wanted to ask? Sure. Um, yeah, actually, this is coming from someone in, who's joining us from Canada. Welcome. Um, so they're saying that in Canada, they have the Canada Wine Wide Wine Awards, and there's always a label category. Um, and they're asking if anyone knows if there are competitions um, for labels here. Know that I know. Jessica probably knows more about this than the rest of us do. I don't know if it's a wine specific one. There are there are awards, Jessica, right, for like branding of some kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like overall branding and things like that. But um I'm not sure about wine specifically. Yeah. Krista, do you know of anything? No, I've never I have sure be. Yeah. For sure. There's there's sure be. Yeah, I think that, you know, as Ari even noted tonight, that there's definitely been an evolution of people feeling um, safe to express themselves. And, you know, Randall, you know, Randall Graham was brought up and like, and Randall Graham's labels are still something that resonates with me that I'm from California too. Anyway, I, there should be, I was about to digress, like there should be, because there's definitely people like producers that I didn't even know, you know, being born and raised in California, like what Randall Graham was, I knew Randall Graham was, but didn't realize until I was, you know, pursuing what I'm pursuing now, like that, that, that hit the connection of his work and how it connected so much with me. But I was, it was his, me seeing his, his labels on a table. Mm -hmm. uh, so there definitely should be. I just don't, I don't think there is, honestly, mm -hmm. at all. Cool. Um, I just want, have to respond to um, a question where Reggie, I think this is a friend of Fab and Sean, saying, are any of you drinking wine right now? I don't see glasses. And I was being discreet. I was being discreet. But I was. Okay, so we got some wine there. I was fully planning to, but then I've had some nausea today, so I'm drinking ginger ale instead. I don't think wine is the best thing when you're a little well, and Lauren and I were actually hoping to drink Krista's wine tonight, but we can't get our hands on it. So hey, laugh. I'll say this, Virginia, I hear you guys. You guys will trust me. I'm don't waiting to know. Right, I've heard it loud and clear. Can we get a bottle of Krista's wine? And we were like, no. you guys are all a herd. I, yeah, I trust me. I got you. Like, just trust me, because you guys have made it very loud and clear. I, I get the memo. Um, 
Yeah. So we have, we have a question that I just uh, definitely want to make sure that we address. So someone said, um, for Goopy, are there many Australian wineries that are seeking out indigenous Arcadio labels and or the names of their wines? And I definitely want to let you answer that, Goopy, but just since we started promoting this event um, in Australia a little bit too, a lot of people have written me emails about how wineries have written me emails saying, I'm working with an indigenous artist, or I'm working with this art center to have the label reflect Aboriginal art because Aboriginal art is so much about country and land and white and wine is about country and land. So I don't know, do you, do you know of others, Kumpi, who are? Yeah, so um, what led me to finding out was um, uh, some anxieties uh, about doing this uh, project with, with um, uh, Thomas. Um, because here there's a lot of stereotypes for our Aboriginal people and basically one of them is labelled as we're all drunks, so alcoholics and so on. Um, so with our culture and our protocols and laws are very strict. Um, our culture is very strict so that it's not uh, something that we make humour of or it's, it's very strict. So using Aboriginal art, which is actually our language, basically. So to use that on, on a wine label with that stereotype, I was really, really anxious about doing it. So um, after asking a few people and got their opinions, I looked online and I found about 10 or so Aboriginal um, designs on Australian wines um, already that was, that was already made. So once I seen that and looked at the artists who they were, they were predominant artists. So therefore it, it eased my sort of mind and, and I said yes and went ahead with it. Um, but with the French one, it's the f first Aboriginal design on a French wine basically, which was which was cool to get. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, as you said, it's, it's a connection to land. So um, especially when you look at, look at the, the red label like if as thomas in his area he's got the red dirt and the wines and the and the vines going along so that would look like where he is every day when he's lo looking after his grapes and so on so um having that connection and and a visual to describe his wine you know definitely that's that's something that that he was looking at yeah i think it's interesting because one of the things that we talk about a lot at Kugi Roo about indigenous australian art is its ability to speak across cultures really effectively as an art form and i love that you've used your art to do that through wine uh which Definitely. is really interesting because it's one thing for an australian winery to put you know indigenous art on their label but it's another different boulder and a different sort of cross-cultural exchange that's happening when it's a french winery so I, yeah. I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and it's cool because a lot of the, um, the uh, artworks, like I got a couple of feedback opinions from people saying that you shouldn't put Aboriginal art on, on contemporary things. But then when we think of that as like we're painting on canvas and we're using paints, which is all contemporary. So, and, and when I got taught culture from, from a young teenager, basically painting is, is, we paint what we see as Aboriginal people or what we do. So my life growing up in the grape fields, I painted that. So it's painting what I, what I lived as an Aboriginal person. So it's part of my history as well. So, mm -hmm. so therefore that's why I went ahead with it. Cool. Someone did just tell us um, in the Q and A that the state fair of Virginia has a wine label competition. So oh. <laughs> for whatever that's um, Lisa, did you have another question that you wanted to pull from the community? Yeah, so there were two questions that um, ask sort of similar, are looking for a similar answer, and, and this would, I think, be directed to Jessica. Um, so Jessica, did you taste Krista's wines before you came up with the design, or did you and Krista talk about concept first? So it was, you know, it's like what came first, the the design or tasting it and then getting the feel for it? Um, well, I think both. Krista tasted the wine. And so that's how Krista came up with the concepts and the names. And then we just went back and forth with different concepts and images. Um, so I didn't personally taste the wine, okay. but from what Krista said, it kind of comes after tasting. And then, um, yes, Gumpy, you said you tasted the wine after 
Yes. After yeah, that's correct. labels, right? You yeah. were the second person to try the wine. But in saying that, um, you're going back on a question before um, about innovation. Um, when I obviously I'm not in the wine industry, so but then I heard Thomas's story of generations making wine. So he's a creator just like me. So mm. as we as um, uh, uh, that and um, Sean was talking about before when people buy wines like obviously you taste it to get that character of the wine but i think with that visual aspect um it's it's innovative because the winemaker gets to go on another level to describe his wine because it's how he felt about it how he thought it tasted and then having that artwork describe that so it's something visual before you even taste it so uh when people look at my artworks on on the wall i'll tell them the story and then they'll get it so once I tell them, they'll connect to it. So with this, I think this is a really awesome idea to have these labels because people will connect to the wine if they hear the story before they even taste it, which which makes sense. There was another question here that um, I'm guessing is for Krista. Um, what do you expect for images on labels for 2020? Or, or for Pat and Sean too. I would love That's to hear true. like where you think this movement of wine labels is going. Um, um, twenty twenty. I'm st like so. We I've only released what I think will be five wines. I still there's still eight wines that are coming out of 2019 that do not have labels for context of labels yet that I'm. So as I'm navigating emotionally, mentally, physically, 2020, um, and you know I'm making my you know I'm starting writing down the names of those wines. I I don't have a, a, a play on words because this last one just was called you know Visions of Giddy. I don't have a vision yet on that because I'm actually still telling the story 2019 <laughs> to be completely you know like and I like it you know and and. Jessica blew my mind with those first five labels, and I know that I get to do eight more with her. Um, as also like it's, which is going to be interesting how these next ones go out because I'm in the middle of 2020, still you know lab going through, still be labeling you know 2019, and I'm out and I have a 2020 vision of 19 now. And you know when when I approached Jessica, you know it was like healing from things of those lines. That the, two, that the first five ones that came out in 2019. So I guess to fully answer the question, um, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm still navigating 2020. I think, it, I mean, I, we still have, there's a lot, you know, it's, what is it? It's August, September is gonna be, you know, I start harvesting, my brain's like wrapped, so I start harvesting a couple of weeks, but I, I, we still have September, October, November, December. And I think we, especially this year, we really do not know what's around the corner, um, so I don't I don't know. Um, but and then you know in regards to you know this is I do I have a plan for example to make 2020 a collection? No, that you know I that was something this 20, 2019 um, was something that's supposed to be made a collection. I I I don't know how I'm gonna part with Jessica because like this was a very the work that she did with this this it's it's it really has. Um, as I feel that she elevated, you know, my vision. I had a vision, but she elevated it with through her heart in a way that through her art that I, in a way that I'm so shook by, and that I never to, to have this seamless connection with someone. And and it, anything is reiterated why I choose to work with people who I didn't need to align with mine because that process becomes similar because I'm not looking for empathy and sympathy. I'm looking for connection. And though, so when I'm selecting artists. You know, it's, I'm very intentional who those people are because I don't even explain myself. I just feel heard. So um, that's the only thing that what, one lesson I learned. You know, we work with Jessica, and I and I and you know, it, this is not in any way and uh, any any criticism on the the peer stars I worked with, but you know, I was very intentional this last minute just to work particularly with a BIPOC person and with a woman, and all, both of which I and then that which I am, and. Um, and that, you know, I'm married to them, my hiring practices as well. And I just reiterated, you know, moving forward, the people that you can expect and be refreshed assured that I predominantly work with will be the yeah, POC women and 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 queer identifying people. So awesome. 
I, I like what you said about not really knowing about 2020 yet because it takes time to process like your own story from a year, especially when you're right. in the middle of the year. It's kind of, it's too early to do that. So yeah, that, that makes really good sense. What about that and Sean, do you have any sense of where the trends are moving on wine labels? Well, um, I mean, luckily there's a lot of wine in the world. Like there's a lot of wine, <laughs> which is a great thing. Um, so I think there will continue to be all different kinds of labels, but I think it's pretty clear that more people are going to like feel comfortable putting fluorescent colors and unpredictable stuff. And, um, you know, in parts of Europe, I guess, um, reject their areas, or the AOC or the, you know, and just kind of call their wine, whatever they, they want to call it that's usually how that goes, right? Like people will start to do experiment and do some stuff. And then I think you'll see that grow. Certainly just based on the emails I've gotten from Australian wineries, <laughs> they're definitely moving towards hiring more indigenous artists to, yeah. to yeah. represent yeah. their wines, which is interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, the wine world has, uh, wine world, like a lot of society, mm -hmm. but the wine world in particular has a, a long, long way to go with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I care a lot. I just want more representation mm -hmm. everywhere, whether that's on the label, uh, what's inside the bottle, who's mm -hmm. selling it, who's, who's in the store, who's buying. Who has the authority to talk about it, to describe mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. to define it. Yeah. Yeah. We feel the same regularly with the art world. <laughs> yeah. Wine right. though, man, I feel like it's especially, I feel like we are especially behind but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lisa did you um yeah so there's I, we've only got like a minute left um but this question I I would like to hear um if any any of you have advice to artists interested in making art for wine and beer labels <laughs> um Advice? Well, my advice to artists or photographers are always shoot what you want to shoot for. If you want to do that, um, what's stopping you from making your own label, slapping it on a bottle, shooting that, and then showing it to the makers that you want to be working for? Um, for myself, personally, it really was just a passion of mine. I shoot a lot of advertising and a lot of food but what i'm passionate about is um very much aligned with what krista is passionate about um working with bipoc women um that's also the way i like running my sets having mostly women and that definitely translated for me in the food world and just finding that community um one of my close friends is a wine buyer and I was just expressing frustration of how just vanilla and just lame <laughs> and not diverse the, that world was. And I never want to be the only one in the room, the only black person, the only woman. And so they kind of introduced me to Shaxbury and co-sellers and the Butch Judy gals. And from there, they introduced me to Chris's work too. Um, so for me, it was really just about finding and building community. Um, and then also even through Krista, like I'm learning so much from her on Instagram and just other black winemakers. Um, so that's another way to practical and just meeting people, forming connections. Goopy, did you want to jump in and? Yeah, I'm cool. um, just, just like everything, self-promotion. So. If it, obviously, if you're interested in that, um, you know, reach out to, to winemakers. Um, uh, obviously, um, you've got an interest in there, so, um, you know, show them your artworks. Um, and basically, in a way, even though it's annoying, but harass them if you really, really want to do it. So, <laughs> and say, look, I've got some good stuff and I, I'd like to work with you. So, yeah. Um, just with regarding my my own experience, it was just a chance sort of thing, and, and being a creative mind, you know, I, I jumped on it straight away. So, um, but in regards to that, yeah, just just push yourself out there and promote, promote, promote. I think it's interesting because it sounds like all of these 
wonderful connections with these amazing labels have come from deep connections with the, which is what you and Krista were just talking about, Jessica. And then also like um, telling a good story, like knowing how to tell a story. Um, but they, like, if I was going to give advice after this conversation, I would say make good connections and tell a good story. <laughs> So, yeah. I, could, I could talk like like an hour about this wine like in my experience with it like creating the label being there at the launch um when i arrived there um just to touch on, on that is we had dinner um the second night and he had the the wood of that grape that was cut off like the a part of the vine which was dry and he put it on the fire and burnt it and then put duck breast on top. So the actual wine that we were drinking, part of that vine was getting burnt and the smoke of that coming into the duck breast and drinking my wine was all a part of that dinner. And, and it was just an awesome experience. So, and he told me, told me about all those stories and how his grandmother passed on that, that sort of um, story to do, to taste the wine even more because it's, it, they're connected as well. So, um, you know, I, I learned a lot as well, um, as well as some French language while I was there, so, which was good. Yeah, telling that story is really important. Well, thank you all so much. Is there anything final? I, we're a little over time, um, but if anybody has anything else finally that they wanted to say that we didn't really get to, feel free to, to chime in. There's a lot of questions that we're missing. I just want to say thank you. This was an awesome conversation and, and the the dialogue is something that you know um i appreciate that you know i wish it was even more more common and and so i i just appreciated this this um this this dialogue and this conversation and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of it yeah thanks to all of you for participating and sharing your stories and your artwork and your expertise with us today um, we really appreciate it. And um, to you audience members out there, sorry if we didn't get to some of your questions. There are some amazing ones that I would love to hear the answers to. Um, we are going to send out an email to everyone afterward with links to um, everybody's work here. And um, someone I know asked whether some of the artwork that's been featured here is available or that's featured on the bottles is available separately as artwork. And I know that that's maybe still true of Zumbi your work. So We'll try to give links to that as well. Krista, did you want to say something else? Yeah, because yeah. um, they the we actually just got the prints, but all the labels that uh, Jessica produced for the first five and Kachin for the rest of the vintage, we actually they will be on sale for poster prints. Um, so oh. we we haven't they haven't hit this, the online store yet, but they're going to be up there uh, next week. Um, and um, but I yeah, it's just more more or less is. A reflection of how impressed I was by her 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 work. I, I think her work is fucking awesome. So anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for well, sharing that because that was actually a question from our museum director. So yes, yes, yes. yes. So that's good to know. Yes. So we'll send links to those things too as we have them. Um, thank you, everybody, for.